thank you very much. It's fun to be here with you. This is an amazing subject uh, that we'll have a chance to start to address over these next three weeks. It's interesting, I just read, ran across another new article this week and it's talked about the historic reversal. And it says it began in 1995 in a single country, Italy, and will spread to 56 nations as diverse as New Zealand and Georgia by 2030. You know what the grand reversal is? The old will outnumber the young. It's interesting, they say that by the year, uh, let's see, what was it, year 2020, uh, Thailand and Cuba, South Korea, will all have more old people and young people. And by the year 2025, there'll be more people who are older in the United States than there are who are younger. It has staggering implications for our culture. One of the amazing things about it, it's not our subject today, but there are not going to be enough young people to pay the cost of caring for the old people. You know what caused that? Abortion. I am one who would like to see every old person who had anything to do with abortion be on their own and not have the young people pay a penny for them. That shows my anger against abortion. But that's not the subject for today. We want to look at some other things. So I want you to start to catch a little bit of what's involved in dealing with this issue. So we'll start with, with this. to it and are we ready to live with them and what we want to recognize is that seven thousands of Americans will turn 65 every day and 85 percent of those will eventually require some kind of caregiving assistance and so what we're talking about is so critical because you're going to be involved in it in one form or another so the issue is, you might not, yourself, be young forever. And most of us don't think of ourselves that way. Now, I'm 70, and Ruthie was very kindly, my wife, watching something on television yesterday, and this 70-year-old man was talking about something. She says, boy, you are young, John. And we think that's a badge of honor, to be young. Uh, scripture tells us something different. I want to tell you an, an amazing story, and this next line will mean a lot to you. There was a man uh, named Roger Simmons, and he, he was hitchhiking his way across the United States on May the 7th. Had a very heavy uh, suitcase, and he was tired, and he was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. And so he's flashing his hitchhiking sign on the oncoming car in hopes that somehow somebody would stop and give him a, a ride home. A black, sleek Cadillac pulled up. T 
to his surprise, the car stopped, the passenger door opened, and uh, the man said, toss your suitcase into the back seat, and uh, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. Well, where's home? He said, Chicago. The man said, oh, you're lucky, that's where I'm going also. He was a businessman, and his name was Hanover. As they were talking about many things in the car as they moved towards Chicago, Roger, who was a Christian, felt compelled to witness to this 50-ish old man, and apparently who had been very successful as a businessman, but certainly not a Christian. But he kept putting it off because he was nervous to share Christ with a successful businessman. So he was about 30 minutes from home, and finally he thought, okay, it's either now or never. So Roger cleared his throat and said, Mr. Hanover, I'd like to talk to you about something very important, and then proceeded to explain the way of salvation to this successful businessman. He asked him if he'd like to receive Christ, and to Roger's astonishment, the Cadillac pulled over to the side of the road. Roger thought he was going to be ejected, but the man bowed his head and received Christ as Savior. Five years went by, and... Roger wanted to see if maybe he could find Mr. Hanover. He had gotten a business card from him and where his business was in Chicago. And so he looked up the address and he went into Hanover Enterprises and a receptionist told him it would be impossible for him to see Mr. Hanover, but would he like to talk to Mrs. Hanover? A little confused at what was going on, he was ushered into the office of Mrs. Hanover and they chatted for a minute and she said, how, how did you know my husband? Roger told her how her husband had given him a ride when he was hitchhiking home. Can you tell me when that was, she said. It was on May the 7th, five years ago, the day I was discharged from the army. Anything special about that day? Roger hesitated. Should he mention his witness to Mrs. Hanover? Since he had come so far, he made the plunge and he said, Mrs. Hanover, I explained the gospel to your husband. He pulled over to the side of the road and wept against the steering wheel and gave his life to Christ. Explosive sobs began to come from Mrs. Hanover. I had prayed for my husband's salvation for years, and I believed that God would save him. And Roger said, where is your husband, Mrs. Hanover? He's dead, she whispered. It was in the car crash right after he had let you out of the car. He never got home. You see, I thought God had not kept his promise. Sobbing uncontrollably, she said, I stopped living for God five years ago because I thought he didn't keep his word. There are so many people like that, friends, who don't understand. I stopped living for God five years ago because I didn't thought, I didn't think he kept his word. He did keep his word. And Roger was able to lead Mr. Hanover to Christ in an amazing way. Now, there's some major terms that I use anywhere I go, and the first of those is that God never lies. I wonder, do you believe that? I mean, really believe that? May I suggest to you, if you don't, you will never be prepared to care for aging parents or age yourself. The second thing is God never is late. That one, I will admit, has been harder for me. The third one is that God's kingdom is never at risk. If we truly believe those things, it changes the way we look at everything. So, what is the greatest tragedy in America? If you listen to the politicians, they'll say everything from global warming, failure of the economy, the threat of ISIS. I wish to suggest to you today that the poison of ruptured marriages and families pouring in our society and the rejection of God is the most serious issue we face. And it comes right at the heart of what we want to talk about today. In Colossians 2, 8 and 9, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And when it comes to aging in particular and caring for aging parents in particular, if this is the case, we will not succeed. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3 says. But what's interesting in the context of that, it says then, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not embitter your children. If we're really going to let the word of God live within us richly, those things are going to show themselves in the families in which we live. Now, Scripture goes and says in many places, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land your God is giving you. Matter of fact, it goes even further than that in Ephesians. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise. So I wonder, how many of you are currently caring for aging parents? How many of you have in the past cared for aging parents? How many of you hope you will never have to care for aging parents? <laughs> now, it is not easy. Uh, I have taught on this subject all over the United States, USC, UCLA, lots of places. And three months ago, my 98-year-old dad, year old dad moved in with us. Uh, since dad moved in, we've been at the doctor more days than not because dad has pretty well neglected his health. Bright guy, sharp guy, goes to Voyagers. My class loves him. Uh, he sings to one of the Bible study classes around here. He's not here today because Friday he had this cancer surgery on his face in three places and he looks awful and Ruthie and I thought, no, it's, it's too disastrous to bring him out in public and have people see him uh, today. But at some point, you might be able to meet him. Maybe our third session, he'll be back, and, and you'll get to meet my 98-year-old dad. But we're living out what I've been teaching. And I will tell you what I'm going to share with you today and what we'll see in the remaining days really works. The scripture talks about you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Now, one of the things you'll find, and I can say it today, I wouldn't say it if Dad was here, it's difficult caring for an aging parent. It's not an easy task. It's not easy for them, and it's not easy for you, because it comes across the grain of our selfishness, of our self-centeredness, and all the rest. But Scripture says we are not to, to ignore that because this is important to God. Matter of fact, in another passage it says, But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might have otherwise received from me is Corban, that is a gift donated to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother. In other words, what people are saying is, Dad, I wanted to help you financially, but I can't because I gave that money to the church. And God says it's just an excuse. Thus, for you nullify the word of God by your tradition, that you have been handed down and you do many things like that. Scripture says this is really important what we're talking about, caring for aging parents. Although it is something most would not choose, either parents or children, it's the design of God and he laid it out this way and it's a part of our dependence on the Lord. Uh, Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Now I am ready to visit you a third time, and you will not be a burden to you, because what, is want, what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Well, we all seem to kind of know that. But when it gets to caring for aging parents, that really gets tested. Now, in my particular case, my dad was employed in a very nice position, had profit sharing with his company. The boss was a crook. And when the boss went ready to retire, he sold the company, but kept all the money for himself. And my dad and his partners never got a penny. And dad could have sued and won, but my mom said, no, I don't want you to do that. That's too much. So they let it go. So all dad has had to live on is his social security. And so I have had very little funds to deal with dad. And we sold his house a couple of weeks ago and so now I have some money to start to do some things, but these have very big financial implications for things. 
I want to say this truly, others have said it as well, every generation prepares for its future in the way it cares for its older people. We're not doing well in the United States on this matter. We put down older people. One of the things I don't even like is the humor that put downs older people. That's why I'm very cautious about what I used when I started. For those of you who have not ever heard this before, many people say, well, I'm having a senior moment. We all know what that means, but I don't like it because it puts down older people. I have a much better thing for you to use. You can tell folks that you have a photographic memory. Regrettably, it no longer offers same-day service. <laughs> that way, we're not putting down older people. But the way we deal with older people is going to tell us so many different things. So I want us to capture what this idea of honoring your mother and father looks like. What does the word honor mean? It means to glory. It's the word heavy weight, significant, elevated, or respect. I gotta tell you, as a 70-year-old man, I still am amused at the younger generation. When I was growing up and something was important, we would say heavy. Okay, so some of you remember that. You know what they say now? Cool. Cool? What does that mean? Heavy really meant something. Heavy meant important. Actually, John, they use the word sick. Sick now. You see, well, that shows how fast it's going. That's sick. Well, it gets even worse. But for our purposes, the word honor means to give weight to, to have meaning about. Now, dishonor, on the other hand, means a mist, a steam, a vapor, light, weak, insignificant, having little worth or value. All right, so you begin to catch here a whole lot about what we're talking about just in the definition of these two words. So God's intention is that we what? Honor our father and mother. That means we give glory, weight, significance, we elevate them, we respect them. Now, on the third session, we'll talk at some length about what do you do with a dishonorable parent. And many of you have that. I've counseled some of you about that. Matter of fact, we won't get to that until the third session. That's hard, but the principle still fits. God doesn't say honor your father and mother only if they're honorable. So today, I want you to really capture just the introduction to this. So honor means you are of great worth to me. You are extremely valuable. So my question would be, as you think about the older person you might be thinking about, is that your mindset? As dad was laying in the bed yesterday with huge bandages down this side, another one behind the ear, and one over here, because they went in and cut out all this cancer, and then we found out there's another big piece of cancer right here under the eye that can't operate on because it'll take his eye. All right, so how do we deal with that? And as I saw my bad dad laying in the bed, it wasn't easy for me to say, he's extremely valuable to me. And he feels that way. Now, is he at times irritable to us? Yes, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Dad tends to be stubborn. There's things that he does that are difficult for us. Uh, just the simplicity of Incontinence is not an easy thing to deal with when you have an older person in your home. Lots of different pieces here will be realistic about all that. But to dishonor means to verbally or non-verbally say, you are of little worth to me. Now, let me just help you with, uh, understand this from kind of a different perspective. Uh, I had my old elder care company. I was dealing with 250 seniors at a time under the Los Santos Superior Court. I was making all their life and death decisions, all of their financial decisions. I've seen it all, done it all. I have people in prison for elder abuse. You probably can't tell me a story I haven't heard or, or haven't dealt with. But one of the things that's amazing to me that people respond to you like you treat them. And one of the issues is caregivers. And if we had a lot of older parents here and we were talking about this, I would say, your children will respond to you as you respond to them. Uh, 
I have one lady, for example, I visited in our own church. And in her home, she was the most abusive person I've ever seen with a caregiver. And I sat there for a few minutes, and I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, you are disgraceful. You call yourself a Christian. There is no reason why anybody would call you a Christian in the way you're dealing with your caregiver. These issues have huge implications because they play out what's going on in our hearts. Are we treating people as if they have value? And we're going to talk about the hardness of that. Some legally next week, I'll tell you more about that. And then real practical the third week. But I think this helps a little bit. It says, on the senior edition of the car, the message on the side mirror says, objects in their mirror wish you would speed up. <laughs> or the change between the young and the old. <laughs> I mean, that, these cartoons show so much if you have time to really talk about them. Now, what is the basis for honor? We're gonna talk about what it is and what it looks like before we're done. But let's talk about the basis for it. And in the advertisement for this seminar, one of the things I said, you will hear things here you will not hear anywhere else. And this is one of the things you will never hear anywhere else. Uh, the books that are written on caring for aging parents don't ever talk about this piece. It starts with honoring God. You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 6.20 if your first regard is to not to honor God, you're going to find it's not going to be possible to do what we're talking about in honoring parents. Now, this is an amazing statement. God is the speaker himself in Malachi. He says, a son honors his father, and a servant honors his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? That's God asking this question. If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? I can say it here because there's nobody in the room that this affects, but I've done lots of funerals. You wouldn't be surprised at that, being pastor of senior adults. You know the one thing that disappoints me the most? Is when I ask family in the session where we're planning the funeral about what was the walk of your husband, spouse, parent, what was your walk with like, God like? And I get blank stares from the other side of the table. God is just very minimal. One of the most recent ones I had, it said, well, my father uh, went to heaven. I mean, went to church. I said, well, did he ever do anything in church? Oh, no, no, he just attended church. I can't tell you how few funerals I get where the person's life was lived to the glory of God, and we could say that honestly. Will they say that about you? Or will they talk about your golf? One funeral I went to, they talked about the drinking. I mean, I don't know what it would be, but do we really say God is receiving the honor from my life that he deserves? If that's out of place, you'll never be able to care for your aging parents because it's going to demand more of you than you have. So every minute of every day, we either be honoring or dishonoring God. Everything we do either honors him or dishonors him. And one of the real revealers of that is how you deal with your aging parent. So how do we honor God? Well, these are just phrases, but we please him faithfully. And would that, would that be a major goal for you? I would love to be able to have people when I'm talking about funeral planning to say, you know, the one thing about my, my spouse, my parent, is that this person wanted to please God more than anything else. Now, I got to watch the funeral of George Beverly Shea on the TV the other day. George was 104 when he died. If you get a chance to watch his funeral, it's absolutely stunning. It's on, the, it's on YouTube. George Beverly Shea was a man who pleased God. My favorite funeral was Ralph Winter, who was the founder of the U.S. Center World Missions. It was a three-hour funeral, and none of us wanted it to be over because we were talking about a man who pleased God faithfully. All right, the second ingredient is to obey him fully. I mean, I really want to do what he wants me to do. One of the big problems we have as Christians is that we're hot, shame, shame, naughty, naughty. 
And so we're trying to obey God out of duty. Now, this is a good place for you me to tell you about next Sunday. I will be here for a minute, but you won't recognize me because I'll be in costume. I'm preaching for Byron next Sunday. It was kind of planned before we planned this seminar, so I won't be here for most of the session next time. I will be the Apostle Paul, and I'm telling the story of the prodigal son in costume in the services that Byron usually preaches. And in that, we're going to hear a lot about the older son who thought he obeyed God, but only because of duty, not because he loved him. So you'll see that next Sunday. So whether you come to the seminar or not next week, be sure you come to one of the church services where I'm preaching, because that's where you're going to get another piece of the seminar, but it won't be in this room. All right, so obey him fully because we want to. Trust him fanatically. And I will tell you that's really critical when it comes to urging for a parish. And then delight in him fiercely. One of the things we'll talk about next Sunday as we look at the prodigal son is what is it to light in the Lord. And, and when you really understand how profound he is, that becomes easy. Isaiah 29, 13 says, These people come near me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So the first ingredient of honoring parents is we have to learn how to honor God. So the way we honor or dishonor God affects, affects everything else we do. And so when it costs you something to care for an aging parent, especially if it's a non-believer, difficult parent, we'll talk about that two weeks from today, that's the real test of this matter. So number two, how do we honor God? By being devoted to one another in brotherly love. And then this one is really interesting. Honor one another above yourselves. Now look around your table a minute. How hard is it for you to honor the other people at that table above yourself? If you ever want a real test of it, think about how you look at the drivers in front of you on the freeway. <laughs> Is our natural tendency to honor others above ourselves? I don't know, maybe you're much better than me, but I find that I have to wrestle with that. So part of honoring God is how we honor one another. This picture really comes from Christ himself, and he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look out not for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I want to tell you that it will be a challenge, and we'll talk seriously about those challenges before we're done with the seminar. But this will reveal more about your relationship with God than your relationship with your parents. And if you're a parent receiving care, it will tell your children more about your wanting to honor God than any other thing about your life. A third way that we honor the Lord is we look at life in the context of aging as God described it to us. And this is an important piece we'll come back to in other senses in the relational center. What does it look like to be an honorable person when you're older? Now, does somebody, Dan, you've got your Bible. Would you read Dan or Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 4? And somebody over on this side, Sandra, you have Bible, right, on the table. Would you read Deuteronomy 32, 7 for me in a minute? All right, so Dan, when you get a chance, Daniel 32, 1 to 4, what does it look like for those who are older? Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 4. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May the teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work, is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness, and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Now that reference is in your notes. You need to go back and look at that in more detail. That's what it looks like to be an older person who's honorable. Your words fall like tender rain on plants. And that you're saying God's way is perfect. And there's something about your life that gives credibility to that. 
Now let's look at the other side of a minute. What does it look like in those who are younger looking to the older? Sandra, could you read verse 7 then? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. Now one of the terms that I like to use with older people is the term elder. Now the term elder is used in two ways in scripture. One is the office of elder. And uh, Dan used to be one, he's not now. I don't see any other elders in the room currently, uh, I think. But there is the office of elder. But then there is the position of elder, and that's the older person. And we're to do what with the older person? Ask them, and they will tell us. So this tells you a lot about what older people should look like. There are people who, in their words, are like rain on tender plant. You know what a lot of older people are like? Grumpy old people. Just stumping all over everybody and crushing everybody. Now if your parent is like that, we'll talk about what you need to do about it. But for today, are you the kind of person who is going to grow into older age and be this kind of person? And to be able to say, as for God, his way is perfect and be believable. If you're younger, then scripture says, what do you do? You go to the older and you seek their counsel. Now, this one is a total lost one in our culture. Interesting where Leviticus has some interesting things to say. 1932, rise in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. I wonder, has there been anybody here? And I'm not, don't respond now. But I wonder if there's any of us here who at least mentally have risen in the presence of an older person in respect and honor. You know what our culture does? Just the opposite. We reject them. Get out of the way. You're not important. All right, so major hindrances to honoring God and honoring your parents is number one, our definition of aging. And I'm going to touch on this because it's so much at the heart of this, and you need to understand it. Your parent needs to understand it. Who is defining what aging is for you? And there's only four sources. The world, the flesh, the devil, or scripture. My teacher says little girls can grow up to be anything they choose. So why did you choose to be an old lady? <laughs> Grandchildren are famous for asking penetrating questions. Or this one, pushing 50, but yeah, I still got it. It was interesting to me down at the corner of Narbonne and Alameda. I don't know if it ever went in, but there was a sign that said there was going to be a fitness thing. And the fitness company was called I've Still Got It. One of the stages of aging is pretending that I've still got it when I don't still have it anymore. So the definition I've gotten from people all over the United States that best captures the mindset of the average person about aging is stay as young as you can for as long as you can and die quick. <laughs> now I would suspect that a great many of you in this room have the same definition, but that's not the biblical definition. This is my shot at a biblical definition of aging. Christian aging is recognizing God's purpose in each season of life and living through each of those seasons with his promise and presence in such a way as to experience his wholeness and enjoy living for his glory. Now one of the amazing things about my dad, lost my mom 14 years ago. They had as an ideal a marriage as you would ever imagine. When mom died, dad's whole life changed and it was sudden. Mom had a massive stroke. Uh, if you need help on this, I know what it is by training, I know what it is by experience. My brother, my dad, and I had to decide what to do with mom's stroke. Do we do heroic efforts or do we let her go? That's not an easy thing to do. I've done it with lots of people. If you ever need help, let me know. I'm good at end of aging, end of life issues. So we had to let mom go and she died. <coughs> I turned to Dad and I said, Dad, how are you doing with the grief? This was a couple weeks after Mom Dad died, and Dad said, John, the grief is so profound, it takes me to the floor. 
But I want you to know that God is filling the empty places in my life where your mother used to be. If you don't remember much about this seminar, that's a line you don't want to forget. God is filling the empty places in my life where your mother used to be. And so dad, at that point in his life, began a new career. And dad must have been 88, something like that, 89, right in there. And so for almost 10 years was a chaplain at the local hospital and sang hymns to people in the Alzheimer's ward. So dad found a new way of living in mom's absence and profoundly affected the people in the community that he lived in. You see what Christian aging is like? Now, let me help you with this one because it's really important. What is God's purpose in aging? Now, I want you to hear with two ears. One ear needs to be for your parent because you need to help them understand this. And two is for you because you need to understand it. 2 Corinthians 4, 7-10. Paul said, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all such passing power is from God and not from us. You know what aging is? It's God's gift to remind you that you're not in charge. You're a clay pot. Now let me be real clear about this. The phrase in Greek clay pot is talking about a chamber pot or a bedpan. Now you know what bedpans are for, right? <laughs> Don't need to get too descriptive. But God says he designed it that way so that the surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, I love this next. It says we're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the happy-go-lucky life that God wants for us. Is that what it says? It says what? The death of Jesus. So the life of Jesus might be revealed in our bodies. Now let me just tell you, if it is your mind to keep buying products to look younger than you really are, you don't get this. If somebody asks you how old you are and you say, I'm a little <laughs> girl, or I'm 39 again, you don't get this. The world is writing your definition of aging. The person who really understands what aging is about from a biblical perspective can say, I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 90, I'm whatever I am, and rejoice in it because God has a reason to have you there. And I will tell you at 70, I'll be 71 in October, this is the best time of my life. I have more aches and pains than I ever did. Uh, there are things I can't quite do like I used to do. I went the other day to just prune a branch, and I heard a rip, and I ripped the muscle in my arm. And so I'm really suffering with this arm now. Welcome to the world of aging. But you know what that's all about? The things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what God's doing. I have more desire for heaven than I ever have. I'll explain that more in just a minute. But notice what he says, we always carry around our body the death of Jesus. Why? So the life of Jesus might be revealed in our bodies. May I suggest to you that if you're not embracing all of the ingredients of aging, it's because you don't have enough hunger to have the resurrection power of God in your life. You're satisfied to be able to play games here. God never intended us to find all of our fulfillment here. His goal is that everything we look forward to is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18, I love this verse. It says, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away. Now again, I'll tell you this from my experience speaking all over the United States on this subject. People tell me that the biggest difficulty for aging persons is loneliness. And I say, no, it's not. It isn't. Loneliness is very easy to deal with. All you do is you have to pick up the phone, find somebody else is lonely, and minister to them, and it's solved. Loneliness is nothing. Now, you may take issue with me. You'll lose if you argue with me on that one, but I'm glad to argue with you about it. That's not the problem. The problem is losing heart because the losses of aging keep chewing things away. Losing friends, losing options, losing health, losing whatever. That's the major problem. 
And scripture says, I don't lose heart, though outwardly I'm wasting away. I love the fact that the Bible looks life square in the face. It doesn't pretend. I can admit I'm outwardly wasting away. Yet inwardly I'm being renewed day by day, for my light and momentary troubles are achieving for me an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now one thing I'll tell you about my dad, he gets this. A lot of pain. You can imagine having big cuts in your face, some of them way deep. And I asked dad, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing okay. A lot of pain. Yeah, I didn't sleep too well the other night. But he rejoices in the Lord because it's not external for him. He's rejoicing in the Lord. All right, notice how it goes on. So we fix our eyes not in what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. One of the major ministries you'll have to an aging parent is to get them to see this. How do I help them recognize the unseen, the eternal, rather than the seen and the temporary? Psalm 71, 18 says, Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, until I fulfill my bucket list. <laughs> it's amazing to me that's what our culture says. That's not what Scripture says. It says, Till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. So if you're an aging person, and you all are, <laughs> is that your goal? Do you want to declare God's power to the next generation? And then how do I help an older person to capture that ministry objective? And so many of your parents will be losing heart. And you need to bring them to the place where they see the truth of these things. All right, another difficulty is the degeneration of life purpose. Now, this is really important. It's only a single slide, but it says so much. We're born dead. Did you know that? Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And so out of our deadness, the first thing we try to do as a younger person is we try to find success and to become successful. And if you'll remember back in your early days, of teen years at least, this becomes a major focus. Now what's happening as we begin to move along into our 20s and early 30s, we'll often find the emptiness of success. And if you do any studies on generations, that's another thing that I really love. Each of the generations has so many characteristics to them. But many people are realizing the emptiness of success as it stands alone, so they've moved to significance. So I'm no longer wanting to give my life to filling bottles with colored water called Coke. I want to do something else. And we call that significant. And I worked for an organization that was national called Significant Living. And one of the things we were trying to do is help people make those transitions. But you know what I found out? Significance isn't where God wants us to be. He wants us to be a new creation in Christ and that he's the writer of the agenda and that means surrender. I'm saying, God, I'm not looking to be significant in my own definition. I want your definition of significance. Rizzy, my wife, has been reading a book about Corrie ten Boom. Do you know her? Prison camp in Nazi Germany. Uh, amazing story. I had a chance to hear her live, and just what a delightful lady. But she tells an amazing story when they were in the prison camp in Germany. And the problem was that the one place that they put them in this horrible spot was full of fleas. And her sister and she were talking, and Corey said to her sister, this is awful. Not only did God put us in a prison camp, but he loves us so little, he put us in a room with fleas. And her, her sister said, Corey, do you realize this is a gift from God? The guards won't come in here because of the fleas. We can hold all our Bible studies here. Such a different perspective in life. And dear ones, if you're caring for aging parents, that's what you need to help them do. How do we get God's perspective on life so we can live in victory when everything screams defeat? A new creation means surrender. God, whatever is you want. Now the neat thing about that, 
is that surrender leads to satisfaction to say, God, your way is the very best. If you're here next Sunday, you'll hear me say, as the Apostle Paul, there is nothing better than doing what God wants. And I'm going to end that message over and over again with the phrase, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it impacts everything as we think about the aging process. So I'm totally satisfied with what God does. But let me tell you what happens next. And this is the stage I'm in. I'm dissatisfied. There's nothing on earth I want beside God. And this is what I love about being an older man, an aging man, is God more and more is making me dissatisfied with everything that's here. Well, not in an, an unhealthy way, but in a sense that he's putting my focus in a different place. And so that dissatisfaction then leads to eternal fulfillment. Now, can I tell you, I'm looking forward to die. Everything I'm looking forward to the future is there, not here. I'm not afraid to die. I want to be here as long as God needs me to be here. That's what the Apostle Paul said. But for me to live is Christ and to die is again. And that progression is what God wants for us. And when we see that progression and are living it, you will, you will age successfully. And your parents will also. All right, a third thing that hinders us is denial. And this is an unsuccessful tool to cope. And we do it all the time. Uh, we say, I'm not this, I'm not that. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 9.8, God is able to make a little grace kind of trickle out to us, so that in a few times, having some of what you need, you just kind of stumble along in every good work. Now may I tell you, that many of your aging parents will read that verse that way, even if they're a Christian. Because the demands of the aging process will be so much that they will be defeated. I might even suggest that some of us in this room read that verse this way. Do you hear what it says? You catch these words all and abound and so forth. Let me go back. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all you need, you'll abound in every good work. Is that true? God never lies. God never is late. His kingdom is never at risk. If that verse is real, do you have what you need to face aging and aging parents? Yes. But if you don't start there, you can read every book you want on caring for aging parents and you won't make it. The reason being because we're living on the resources of our own ability. And so we have to deny anything that's too much for us. And I've seen this all over the place when I've dealt with aging people. Denial is what I have to do because I'm living in my own resources and it's too much for me. I love the phrase in, the, in a great old song. It says, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, God's full giving has only begun. So what aging and caring for aging parents is going to do is going to give you an opportunity to live beyond your resources and to live in the fullness of his. And I'll promise you there is nothing more exciting or exhausting than that. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, the whole chapter is amazing. It says, as slaves of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, distresses, sorrowful yet always rejoicing poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. A fourth reason why we have problems with these issues is the deficiency of the fullness of God based on ignorant rejection of God's promises. I love this prayer in Ephesians 3. Paul says, I pray that according to, now many of your translations will say out of, that's not a good translation. It's according to God is so abundant in his riches, so according to his glorious riches, that he'll strengthen you with power and his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to 
grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now why does he want that? This is the amazing piece of it, that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So I really have two questions that relates to our subject today. As the one who may be offering caregiving to your parents, are you doing it out of the inexhaustible supply of the fullness of God in your own life? Now what's so interesting you will find, and I can really prove it with so many stories, you will come to your parents, and your life may be here, and your parents' need may be down here. And you're going to find that these resources that you have are going to stay put, and your parents' needs are going to start climbing and climbing and climbing, and they will pass your resources. What you do in that moment is going to have so much to do with the success or failure of this whole subject. If you draw on the resources of Christ, you will find both for your parent and for yourself, these will be some of the richest days you've ever had. All right, so I'm filled to all the measure of the fullness of Christ. Now go on to him who is unable, no, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work. Do you know where it's at work? At the church. No, in the hospital? No, it says in you. In other words, God's promise is, if this is true, that God will give you everything you need for whatever is required of you. First Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Do you know the promises of God? The degree to which you do and are practicing are the degrees in which you'll deal with your own aging and the aging of those that you're caring for successfully or in failure. God promised he'd give us everything we need and it's so much based on his promises. So do we live the promises or do we live our problems? I heard once a man say, stop praying your problems and start praying the promises. I like that. I thought that was a really great balance. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to bless you abundantly. All things, all times, having all you need abound in every good work. Is that real? Does God lie? Now this one is to me a real personal one because it came to me when my wife got breast cancer 14 years ago. And I was struggling with that as you can imagine. And God gave me this verse and he said, Blessed is the person who finds great delight in the Lord. Such a person will not live in dread of what may happen, nor fear evil circumstances, for they're settled in their mind that Jehovah will take care of them can't begin to tell you what a profound psalm that is. Don't live in dread of what may happen or fear of eagle circumstances, for Jehovah will take care of them. Now, I want to put this to music a minute. I'd like you to let just this kind of settle in. Decisions must be made.
is the foundation, you're not going to hear that foundation anytime people teach you this in any other setting. And if you don't get this one right, everything else we're going to tell you practically next week and the week after means nothing. This is the foundation. God says, honor your father and mother. It's the only command with a promise. We've talked a little bit about what that means. We've talked a little bit about the resource you get to get it. Now, in the back of your page, you'll see there's a last sheet. And on it are a bunch of questions. And for the next few minutes, what I want you to do is sit around your table, look at those questions, and begin to discuss them a little bit. You'll come back to these next week as well. We will be having somebody from HELP here who will be talking to you about very practical, legal, financial issues that deal with aging people. And I'll be here to introduce that, and they'll lead you in that session. But for today, I'd like you to take some of those questions, begin to talk about them around your table a little bit, and I'll come at the very end and close and pray. Joyce came up to tell me she's moving to San Francisco, and I thought, oh, okay. Joyce is a dear friend, works at Home Depot. It's my second place of love. <laughs> I love seeing her there, and I thought, why in the world is she going to San Francisco to care for her aging mother? So this really hits close to home. We'll talk real practically about a lot of things in days that are ahead. But please don't miss this piece that we talked about today. Because none of the rest of it will make any difference if you don't get this one. I can give you all the practical stuff. There's lots there that will help you. But you've got to get what we talked about today. Honor your father and mother. It's God's command. Because of it, God will give you everything you need to do to pull it off. We're here to help. This will be a great gift to you if you receive it from him properly. I don't say that empty-handed. I know this is not simple stuff to do. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. I'm anxious to get real practical with these folks before we're done, but this piece is the most important. If we don't get this one right, none of the rest of it will work. Help us to understand, Lord, that this really isn't an option. This is what you've commanded us to do. And since it is command, it's also a promise. And it is the means by which you put us to death so the resurrection power of Christ could live in us. I pray that you'd help these folks to begin to capture some of these things and it would change the way we look at our own aging and that we can help our aging parents look differently at their aging. I pray especially for those who have parents who don't know you. We ask that through the aging process you might allow that parent to come to know Christ because of what they see in their child. Pray also, and Pat reminded me of this, for some it's dealing with spouse. How do I deal with the aging spouse? The principles are exactly the same. So Lord, dismiss us from this place. Help us to share some really good things in the two weeks remaining. And we'll thank you because we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.